So I don't know if you're working on that or not. But let me reiterate what a great, uh, what a great tool it is uh, to memorize the Word of God. And here we have Jesus' most famous sermon. And you can still do one verse a day for the rest of this series and get it done. And so if you've been doing it so far, you are past the Beatitudes, which we are in today. And, uh, and again, just a, just a challenge to you if you feel led. And you can hold me accountable. I may not make it. The last time I gave it a shot, I'm trying to remember which book it was, uh, but I, I think it was Hebrews. I made it a couple chapters in, and then I failed miserably. Uh, but I didn't fail because I had the Word of God, at least some of it memorized. So what a great uh, what a great tool that is. So anyway, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. I won't shame you if I see you turn into Matthew chapter 5. I promise. So, hey, let's get into this a little bit. Let's talk about our attitudes and the shedding of our ungodly attitudes and the shedding of the things in our hearts and our minds that are of God. So when we study scripture, when we study the word of God, one of our objectives is to read out of the word of God, to exegete the word of God, not read into the word of God. I don't want to take my own preconceived notions, my own biases, my own presuppositions and apply those to the word of God. We affirm that the word of God has a meaning. It has an intended meaning as communicated from the Holy Spirit through the author. And our goal in studying the word of God is to ascertain what that meaning is. And then we interpret it and we apply it to our lives. And there are infinite applications to the word of God. And I'm here to affirm to you that there is a singular meaning of the word of God. And so anytime you're studying the word of God, a temptation... People like to categorize the Word of God. Have you ever seen the categories of the Word of God that are invented by men? I'll give you an example. When you look at the Old Testament law, people have categorized the Old Testament law into civil, ceremonial, and moral. And then they say we don't, we don't hold to the civil and ceremonial aspects of the law anymore. We hold to the moral aspects of the law. And it's nice and neat and it's clean and it's easy. The problem is, is that the word of God will not be constrained and defined by man-made categories. You look at the law and, and many of the laws straddle different categories. And who decides which category the law is going to be in anyway? And who made up these categories anyway? I can't find that in scripture anywhere. So when we look at the Beatitudes today, we see some simple, and, there, and there's utility. It can be useful to think about things like the law in terms of these categories. But we've got to realize that these are man-made. These, these are not invented by God, that men have made these things up to help them understand the Word of God. When we look at the Beatitudes, it's tempting as well. There's eight of them. So naturally, there should be two categories of four and four, right? And so the, the, the theologians over the years have defined these as the first four Beatitudes apply to our position, our relation to God, our relationship with God. And the second four apply to our relationship with our fellow man. And again, that sounds nice and neat. That sounds clean. But here's the issue is, once again, the word of God will not be defined by men. And there's bleed over. There's bleed over. Because how I deal with my fellow man, how I view and deal with other people is directly influenced and defined by my relationship with God. My relationship with God, my standing before God, the way I interact with God, how I am before God drives and governs how I perceive, how I deal with, how I, how I relate to my fellow man. And so the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes up and he proclaims the message, Matthew 4, 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the message. We've got to be proclaiming this message with our mouths, with our words at all times. This is the message. It's prescriptive. You want to be in the kingdom of heaven. Now there is the recipe for how to do that. Repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then he goes up onto the mountain. He sits down. The disciples come to him. He opens his mouth and he begins to preach saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And today, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And so we're going to talk about the condition of meekness today and how that pertains to how we relate to our fellow man. How do we relate to our fellow man. Our lives ought to validate this message. Matthew 4, 17. It's not the other way around. We don't proclaim the gospel with our lives. Our lives 
validate this message. So how does the condition of meekness validate the message? So we're going to talk about meekness today. I don't seek to be meek. I, I didn't wake up this morning and say, hey, I, I really need to be more meek. I'm going to go and, and be meek today. I'm going to set out to be meek. No, I am meek. And I am made meek by certain things in the Word of God. It's the Holy Spirit convicting me of what the Word of God actually says. What does it mean to be meek? Here are some synonyms. Humble. Humble. Submissive. Yielding. Gentle. The idea is power restraint. I wrote a thing on, on meekness this week uh, in, in terms of submission. And interestingly enough, uh, I have a, a relative who is not of the Lord, and he was very offended by this idea of meekness in terms of submission. And so what we see is that the idea of meekness in many ways runs contrary to what is most natural to men. So let's talk about this. So again, one of the business of a believer is to shed ungodly attitudes because the problem is, is that our ungodly attitudes inevitably reveal themselves in our actions and in our words. It's inevitable. It's always going to happen. Now, I can proclaim this message, Matthew 4, 17, all day long and still live like the devil. I mean, I can. There's nothing to keep me from doing that. I can, I can walk around telling people to repent all the time and still live in open and blatant sin. There's nothing to keep me from doing that. In fact, that happens. <laughs> Unfortunately, that, I mean, that, that's, that's one, of the, one of the bad things about what, what, what goes on in the church is that exact thing happens. However, the converse will happen. People will refrain from proclaiming the message because of how they live. They say, well, I don't want to look like a hypocrite. I got this, this persistent sin in my life, and so therefore I'm just going to keep my mouth shut, and I'm not going to proclaim. And Satan whispers that into our ears. He says, how can you go and proclaim this particular message when you live like the devil? People will see right through you for the hypocrite that you are. It is a tool of Satan to convince us to keep our mouths closed, to keep us from proclaiming these particular words of life. But we got to flip that around. we got to flip that upside down. It's like communion. Paul tells us when we take communion, he says, don't take of the, of the bread of the elements in, in an unworthy manner. You, you shouldn't do that. That's judgment upon yourselves. People say, well, then I just won't take communion this time. No, that's not the point at all. The point is, is that we use communion. That is an opportunity for us to get right with the Lord. We don't refrain from taking communion and, and just be content to not be right with the Lord. We use that as an opportunity to repent or whatever it is that we need to do in our lives. And so it's the same thing with this message. I have an obligation. I have a duty. I saw a quote from David Platt this week I really love. He said, every believer this side of heaven owes the gospel to every unbeliever this side of hell. You owe it to them. It is your duty. You are duty bound to proclaim this message right here. And so let's let that duty drive us, motivate us to do what we have to do to align our lives with our words. So that our lives validate our words. We're not content to be silent. No, we use our refusal to be silent as motivation to empower the Holy Spirit, to cultivate the things of the Spirit inside of us so that we can validate the message with our lives. We've got to be shedding attitudes on God at all times. Because again, the problem is our attitudes always reveal themselves in our actions. Consider Judas. For three years, Judas proclaimed. He followed the Lord outwardly for nearly three years. But you can only fake it for so long, right? You can only fake things for so long. And so eventually his outward actions began to conform themselves under the influence of Satan to who he really was on the inside. And so we seek alignment. We seek agreement between our lives and our words and really even different aspects of our lives. Are you the same person in every place in your life? I know people that have their work selves, and then their home selves. Serving in the military for years, I had men who say, well, when I go to war, when I go to combat, I, I just flip a switch and, and I become, you know, combat brat as opposed to, you know, home brat. And I used to say to them, well, if you are a different person here than you are anywhere else, that's a problem. 
my children joke that there's uh, two brads. There's church brad, <laughs> and then there's home brad. You know, church, I'm friendly brad. Hey, I'll pray for you. What can I do for you? What can I do for you? And then home brad, I get a little grumpy on occasion. Don't nod your head, George. There he was. There she would nod her head. So one of my goals is absolute alignment between myself, every aspect of my life, and the message. I seek congruence. I seek alignment between every aspect of my life and the words of my mouth. So let's talk about this condition of meekness. Let's talk about what it means to be meek. And we're going to talk about Jesus because Jesus is meekness personified. Let's talk about the things that we say about Jesus when we think about conforming our lives to the things that we say. Well, here's who is Jesus? We've been, we've been talking about Jesus for months now, we did an entire series, we're partway through an entire series where we just talked about the person of Christ, who Jesus is. So let's remind ourselves yet again from Colossians chapter 1, I mean, this is one of my favorite passages of scripture. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. That is who Jesus is. I like Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that he's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. This is who Jesus is. Who he is. Well, let's consider for just a minute what he did. So I spent some time this week reading through the Gospels and the accounts of the crucifixion. Now, let's not get confused. You know, crucifixion was designed by men. It's amazing how many different ways men have invented to inflict pain and agony and suffering on one another. I mean, it's our, our capacity to do that is, is quite surprising or maybe unsurprising. But make no mistake about it, the, the real suffering and pain of the crucifixion was that Jesus endured and he drank the entire cup of the wrath of God against the sin of men past, present, and future who would believe that he drank that and that God poured out his wrath upon Jesus. That was the real agony that he endured. Now the crucifixion was no doubt an agonizing and brutal form of execution. I mean, the, the Romans were, were brilliant at inflicting the max amount of suffering and pain as possible upon the victim. Well, let's consider just another aspect of the crucifixion, if we will, for just a minute, when we talk about this idea of meekness and Jesus being meekness personified. They spit in his face. Have you ever had anybody spit in your face? Is there anything that displays contempt and hatred more than spitting in somebody's face? They slapped him. And again, spitting and getting spit in your face is not going to kill you. That's not going to suffer you greatly. They slapped him. And not only did they slap him, they mocked him as they slapped him and said, hey, who's, who's slapping you now if you're a prophet? They stripped him, beat him with an inch of his life. Mocked him again, put a robe on him, crammed a makeshift crown upon him, hit him with a reed in the head. They shamed him, they humiliated him. As they took him to the cross. Let's consider another aspect of the crucifixion. One you don't hear talked about much. It is almost entirely possible. Not possible. I believe it to be 100% true. That Jesus was crucified completely and 100% naked. Naked. Popular images of the crucifixion show him with you know, a loincloth to preserve his modesty. Crucifixion always, always involved the nakedness of the victim. Why is that? Because not only was it brutal, 
physically it was designed to shame and to humiliate so you can imagine being completely and 100 percent naked and vulnerable and exposed now scripture is not one of, it doesn't stipulate 100 percent uh you know either way what the case was and there is a case to be made that maybe the romans preserved you know that, that, that because the jews saw nakedness as so shameful that they would have they would have allowed him to have a small covering just to not to make the rest of the jewish leaders angry but Hear, hear me now that, that if the Lord was not going to spare him one iota, why on earth would he preserve even one shred of his dignity? That as he went to the cross, he was 100% exposed and shamefully naked as he was beaten and spit on and slapped. His mother was there watching. I was reading through that this week and meditating on that. And one of the, one of the gifts God has given us is our imagination. We can put ourselves into Scripture. And so I ask you, where were you at the crucifixion? Were you the one spitting in Jesus' face? Maybe you struck him with the reed. Maybe you were holding his arm down as the soldier was driving the nail into his hand or his wrist. Maybe you were the one pinning his arms down. Where were you at the crucifixion? Where was I at the crucifixion? The ironic thing about the crucifixion is it's like a firing squad that all of us are a member of. Every single one of us are a member of this firing squad pulling the trigger and executing the man for the crime that you and I committed. Consider that for just a minute, the, what that actually means, the power behind that statement. And we have been given the heart of Christ. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, you've been given the heart of Christ. And this is the heart of a man who kneeled in the garden and he said, God, take this cup from me. I don't want to go through this, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will, God. He looked and he knew what was coming. He saw the shame and the humiliation to come. He saw the pain and the agony to come. He saw the cup of God's wrath to come. And he said, not my will, but your will. This is a picture of meekness that we are willing to turn over the keys to ourselves and say, God, I am yours. Do with me what you will. Maybe in your will, it is your will that somebody would spit in my face. Maybe it's your will that somebody would bruise me or beat me or slap me or mock me. I don't care, God. I give to you the keys to myself. This is the picture of meekness. And if you are of Jesus, you have been given that heart of Christ. What does that look like in our daily lives? I see a lot of people... Say a lot of different stuff, and uh, unfortunately, I'm on social media. <laughs> we prayed about it over the years, and it's like, well, that's where the people are, so we'll be on social media, and, and it's good. It's a tool, and I'm actually completely envious of people who have removed themselves from social media. But you see a lot of things that people say, and and it allows you to see kind of prevailing attitudes and thoughts. And there's there's a lot out there. Here's one. I'm no doormat. I'm no doormat. I saw this one the other day. Be, uh, this is for ladies, be a diva. Be a diva, not a doormat. God didn't put me on this earth, this planet, to be a doormat. God did not make, put me here to be some kind of pushover, to be trampled upon, to be walked upon. God did not raise me up just so that I could lay down and be used and abused by other people. God did not call me to be a doormat. This is a very prevalent thought pattern we see that's out there these days. Let's talk about this for just a minute because this attitude, this prevailing thought pattern, it has its origins in the garden where God, where God said, this is the way. I've given you the way, man. Here's the way you ought to live. And man looked at God and said, thank you very much. We'll take it from here. We will do what we want to do. And it's interesting, really interesting, if you look at our very nation. I mean, it's, it's Memorial Day weekend this weekend, and I think we ought to pause and remember those who have lost loved ones, no matter your politics, no matter how you feel about our conflicts and our nation. Uh, the bottom line is that, that men and women have lost Greatly, So we have to honor that. We have to remember that sacrifice that people have made. But if you look at the origins of our nation, our nation is founded upon what? Rebellion. Rebellion. It's interesting if you go back and, and look at the history. 
And, and please don't hear me. I mean, Smith's talking poorly about the country. Don't hear me poor mouthing our country. I love the United States of America. I think it's the greatest country that there is. I've never, never found another place I would rather live. But if you look at the history of our country, there was great debate during this time about the biblical validity of the rebellion. The founding fathers went to intense lengths to justify the rebellion biblically. Well, why did they do that? Well, because in those days, most people went to church. Most people went to church. And how people believed something was biblically would be whether they would get in line behind it or not. Whether they would support it or not. And so the founding fathers were forced to paint and to, to portray the rebellion as a defensive war. This is a war of defense. The, the British are aggressor, or they're the aggressors against us, and we have to defend ourselves. They had to paint it in this light because they could not justify outright rebellion biblically. It's, a, it's interesting when you see that, that the very origins of our even our own nation and our own culture are rooted in rebellion. And it gives rise to this attitude of, hey, I'm no doormat. I don't want to be trampled upon. Don't, I'm not a pushover. I'm self-confident. We hear a lot of people talking about self-confidence. I can, I can do and accomplish and obtain anything I set up. I mean, that's the American dream, right? That, that releases us to, to be self-confident, to be self-assertive. I'm not going to just stand here and let people trample all over top of me. I'm not just going to sit here and let people push me around. I'm going to be so assertive and there's a brashness, there's a haughtiness, there's a pride that comes along with this. Let me hear you. Let me tell you that. Maintaining, preserving, and protecting the rights to yourself is hard work. I mean, it's exhausting to protect and maintain and preserve the rights, the, the, the sovereignty of your own self. It's hard work. Work. Is this the attitude of Jesus? Is this the attitude of Christ? Let's talk for the remaining few minutes we got here. I want to talk about a very visible manifestation that indicates whether we have the meek hearts of Christ, and that is the concept of submission. Submission. The Bible calls every believer to submit in a multitude of different ways, and our willingness to submit joyfully. It's an outward display, an outward indicator of a meekness in our hearts. Our culture despises submission. We hate the idea of submission. We equate it with subjugation, subservience, weakness even, this idea of submission. And, and again, my, my, uh, my cousin that was uh, outraged by my thing I wrote this week about submission, I mean, he was just aghast. He could not believe that I would call anyone to submit. Well, let's talk about the concept of submission for just a minute and the different ways that God calls us to submit. For starters, he calls everyone to submit to God frequently over and over again throughout Scripture. We're called to submit to God, but the natural man does not want to submit to God. We're called to submit to the church and our church leaders. Listen to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 17, talking about the church. Obey your leaders. And submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. Well, as the author of Hebrews, obviously it's just him. Well, Peter says something on the matter too. First Peter 5, 5, he says, uh, be subject to the elders. Be subject to the elders. Submit to the church. Listen, church membership is assumed throughout the New Testament, and it's good for your soul is the bottom line. A church member, the Bible knows nothing of a church member outside the body of Christ. The Bible knows nothing of a church member who's on an island by himself. It is biblical for us to submit to the church and the leaders of the church. Every believer is called to submit to the government. Every believer is called to submit to the government. Listen to Paul in Romans 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that, have been, those that exist have been instituted by God. This is Paul talking about submission to the government. Again, you might say, well, that's just Paul. Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And he agrees with Paul. Listen to what he says. Be subject for the Lord's sake. To every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Over and over again, we're told to submit to the government. And, and there's no caveat given for the godliness of the government. Was well, it a good government? Is it, is it a godly government? It doesn't say it says submit to.
to the government. And consider the type of government that was in place when Paul wrote these words, when Peter wrote these words. This was a government that could command every single person to return to their hometown for a census. Can you imagine our government today coming out saying every single person right now go to where you were born so that we can count you? Can you imagine how we would respond to that? This is the type of government that could order the slaughter of every male child two years old and younger in, in a particular place. This is the type of government that could take Christians and literally light them on fire to light the streets. This is the type of government that could take Christians and throw them into the arena to be consumed for entertainment by wild animals. And the only thing that scripture says is submit, be subject. Jesus himself says, render to Caesar the things of Caesar and to God the things of God. Over and over we are called to submit to the government, submit to the church, submit to God. Other acts of submission, book of Ephesians. I love the book of Ephesians, one of my favorite books. The first three chapters of Ephesians give us this great doctrine concerning predestination, election, and the mystery of God. And the last three chapters say, well, because of those doctrines, here's how you act. Submit. Now, a lot of people will look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, and say it says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And they say that every believer is called to submit to every other believer. That's not what Paul is saying. And it's almost as if we're embarrassed of the idea of submission, that we've allowed the world's idea of submission to creep into our hearts and our minds. Because he tells us exactly how we are to submit. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Children, obey your parents, honor your father and mother. Bond servants or slaves, obey your earthly masters. You can make a strong case that that is workers submit to your bosses. You know, again, well, that's just Paul. Well, Peter says the exact same thing in 1 Peter chapter 3. Wives, be subject to your husbands. Children, be subject to your parents. Slaves, obey your masters. He says the exact same thing. Thing. Over and over again, we are called to submit. And our willingness to submit joyfully is an indicator of a meekness in our hearts. Because let's go back to the top, the, the government or even the church. You hear people say things like, I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. I love Jesus. I just don't like the people of the church. Now, let, me, let me ask you a question. What are you communicating to the world by a refusal to submit to the church? You're com com communicating outright disdain for that which Jesus loves the most, that which Jesus died, the church. I mean, this is the bride of Christ. And the, 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 the church is the hands and feet of Jesus in the local community. Why would we not submit to the church, the government? What do we say about our governed leaders? Not my president, right? He's not my president. And people are saying, yeah, right, we shouldn't be saying that. Well, what were you saying when President Obama was in office? What were we saying then? Is that our president? Listen, I'm not talking about legitimate civic activity. I'm not talking about legitimate protests and things of that nature. I'm talking about the way we speak about our duly elected leaders. I'm talking about the way we think about them, the way that we look at them. We are communicating something to the world by the way we either submit or do not submit to our government. How are we validating the message by how we interact with our government? Husbands, parents, our masters, our bosses at work. Listen, I mean, and I can give the caveat, too, of, of the man being called to, to love his wife as Christ loved the church. But wives, you want to validate this message right here? We submit to our husbands. You don't slander our husbands, don't speak poorly. I hear ladies speaking poorly about their husbands to other ladies. You want to undermine the message that we've been given to proclaim, then speak poorly about your husband to somebody else showing a refusal to submit. You want to do the same thing with your parents. And it doesn't stipulate whether you're grown or young or old. Do you honor your mother and father? This is a way to validate the message. How do you talk about your boss at work? When that man comes in and he says, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And you're thinking in the back of my mind, this is the most foolish thing I've ever seen anybody do in my life. This is ridiculous. And who do you tell about that? You go to the, to the coffee room or outside the, the snack bar at work and you talk about what a fool your boss is. There's no greater way to invalidate the message than that to, to display a lack of meekness and a lack of submission. How do we submit? And that is how we validate the message. That is how we show a meekness in our hearts. Listen. 
This is a struggle. This is a natural struggle for men because we do men, when we do not have a heart of submission, Christ gives us a heart of submission. When he gives us that new heart, when he gives us a heart of flesh to replace our hearts of stone. And so my challenge to you today, my challenge to us today, to me today, is how do we display the meekness that God has given us in our hearts? Do we display that by our submission? Where are we challenged at? Are we challenged anywhere? Maybe you're not challenged anywhere. I would suspect that there are folks here that are challenged by this call to submit over and over and over again. And maybe it's to God. Maybe there's somebody here who has never submitted to God and never fallen upon the knees and said, God, I turn over the keys of myself. I turn over the keys to my life to you. I don't... I'm not concerned about maintaining the right to myself anymore. I, I, I want to submit to you, God. So as we close in a word of prayer, my prayer is that we would use this as an opportunity to examine ourselves. Where do we need to submit and show the meekness that Christ has given us? Let us pray. Lord. I just love you and I praise you, Jesus, and I thank you so much for all that you have done. God, when I consider who you are, when I consider who you are and what you have done, God, I'm humble, I'm made poor in spirit, I mourn my sin, and God, I am meek. God, I turn over the keys to you, to my life, I turn them over anew every single day. And I do that fresh and anew right here, right now. God, maybe there's some here who struggle with the idea of submission. Struggle with this outward manifestation of this inward quality of meekness. God, may we all refuse. May we all refuse to try to maintain our own sovereignty. May we see these attempts to stand up for our own rights, our own uh, things that we deserve, our own protection, our own whatever, God, is what they are. And may you give us a heart of submission in all the different ways you've called us to submit. God, may our lives validate the message. May our lives always validate the message. May the message fall from our mouths every single day. The message of repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God, may we always proclaim this message. And may our lives validate that message. Through humble lives of submission. God, give us the heart to submit. And I just ask all these things in your holy name.